Well, welcome, everybody. I, I'm, as Jonathan says, I'm a, an independent in the House of Lords, and I have the honour of chairing this uh, commission on creating healthy cities. And we're just we're, we're at a really sort of crucial and important stage. We we've got to launch our report on the 13th of July. And th there will be a last minute panic, there always is a last minute panic with all these reports, but it will come out on the 13th of July because I've got to stand up in the House of Lords and <laughs> wave it about. So this will happen. Uh, so we're in the, the final throes. Uh, we, our, our theme is really that you need the prism of health, of looking at health and well-being as the way that you judge a whole range of other policies policies about the built environment, about housing, about healthy places, about transport systems. You use health as the, as the way on which you, you, you determine where your policies should go. And that works in lots of different ways, including addressing uh, inequalities more generally and poverty, because they are so closely interrelated, poor health and uh, poverty and inequality. So this is the, that's the way that we're focusing, and we've divided our, our report into a series of sections. We look at the built environment issues, healthy homes, healthy places, the areas around the home. We look at uh, transport and mobility, healthy transport, walkability, cycling, uh, doing the, the things that get you out of the house, the active mobility, is, as it's called. Uh, we, we look at those things. Then we look at uh, healthy lifestyles, even healthy eating. So we, we cover the spectrum, and we think that health is the focus that uh, policymakers should keep in mind when they're looking at a whole range of other issues. It's the holistic drawing together of the, of the different threads of policy uh, with health at, at its core, that uh, we are pointing the civic leaders, the mayors and the, and the leaders of councils in that, in that direction. Think health, think place, think health. Uh, Anyway, we're going to uh, now fill out that, that uh, little brief introduction with some reality uh, from both uh, academic perspectives and from practitioners who, who really know about these things on the ground and are doing, doing great work. And I'm going to introduce each of our speakers in turn. They've got five minutes. Hmm. This, this is where the, the chair gets well tested. Only five minutes uh, to allow us time for, for questions and discussion to take us around to the hour. So uh, it's Dr. Helen Pineo uh, who starts us off. She's Associate Professor at UCL uh, in Healthy and Sustainable Cities and her research uh, spans urban design, planning and health and well-being. And uh, uh, Helen, you have a new book out, Health Urbanism, Designing and Planning Equitable, Sustainable and Inclusive Places. I think probably read your book, ignore the Commission's report. This is probably where the, re the real uh, 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 absolute essence of, of, the, of the subject lies. Helen, thank you very much for joining us. Over to you. Thank you. Are you okay with holding that? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> so thank you for having me this evening. We were asked to respond to the question, uh, what role for the built environment in creating healthy cities? And of course I would say there's a huge role for the built environment. Um, I think it's undervalued though. So I think in a lot of the ways that we talk about what impacts our health, we tend to focus more on biomedical approaches, thinking about medicine, moving a little bit into things like behavior, smoking, diet, physical activity. But I still think all of that undervalues the huge scope that the built environment plays on our health and well-being. And maybe that lack of understanding of how our environment and cities influences our health leads us to create places like this. So these are um, Twitter um, tweets from somebody called Planning Shit. And they are giving us a bit of tongue in cheek, but also really um, these are real places that are being built around this country, which are poor quality design and um, some work by Matthew Carmona at UCL has verified that there is a lot of new development coming forward which is of poor quality design that would be harmful for health and well-being. So I think we need to really rethink the way urban environments impact health and well-being. And so I've taken um, an approach called Thrives. I've created this conce conceptual framework to help us understand the impact of decisions that we make within cities at different scales from buildings uh, through to designing energy systems, so regional, um, city region uh, scale. And at the center of this diagram 
is uh, planetary health and recognizing that if we don't support planetary health through um, improving um, zero carbon design or energy efficient design in buildings and in cities through things like um, creating habitat and improving biodiversity that we won't have um, health, we won't have a, a planet that will support our health. So traditionally we would find people at the center of diagrams about um, what determines our health and well-being and I've intentionally inverted that. We also see um, three intersecting core principles, sustainability, equity, and inclusion. So these are um, principles that should be guiding our design and planning decisions, but they haven't been. When it comes to health and well-being, these areas have been secondary. They haven't been at the forefront of guidance um, from public health. And I can say that with some confidence because I did a review of public health guidance documents and existing frameworks, and those uh, factors were really missing. So this is what I think we should be considering, multi-scalar health impacts over time and space, thinking about planetary ecosystem and local health, and also those three core principles. I have uh, created a website and we've done um, some research into case studies around the world that can give us inspirational examples of healthy urbanism, because I think there's a lot of examples about what isn't going well, but we need to focus on what we can do to create healthier places. These are three of the projects that you can find on the website and with further information, but um, each of these I've kind of used to um, emphasize a, a point that I think is a key practice of healthy urbanism. So the first one is about thinking beyond the boundaries of the development. So we tend, when it comes to health impact assessment or thinking about health impact in other ways, we look at the red line of a new development and we don't necessarily think beyond the red line in terms of neighboring communities very well, although that was done really well at Barton Park. That's actually one of the case studies in my book. Um, but we certainly don't think very well over the, the temporal boundaries, thinking about the impact over time. The second point is about targeting interventions. So I mean, if we have investment in the built environment in terms of perhaps transport infrastructure or um, upgrading housing, targeting those interventions in communities with the greatest need, but then doing that with a, um, an inclusive design process so that we're not assuming that as built environment professionals, we know what they might need, but doing that with them to make sure we get it right. And then finally, to use sustainable design principles for health. I think this has been under leveraged as a solution for healthy built environments. So using energy efficient building design can help us have um, warmer buildings in the winter and cooler buildings in the summer if we use integrated design methods. Uh, so I think there's a lot of scope to increase the use of sustainable uh, design methods. So all of these concept are, concepts are set out in my book, which is coming out next month with Palgrave Macmillan. And you can um, look on the um, uh, information on the website now for the case studies and further details. Thank you very much. Thanks, Helen. Yeah. Great, and, and in the five minutes as well, fan fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. So straight on, and we're going to hear a bit more about Barton Park uh, uh, in a moment, because uh, uh, Iona O'Carroll is a Community Health Development Officer at Oxford City Council. She's been working with this uh, Barton Healthy Newtown project funded by Grosvenor, uh, and that is the, trying to see how best to integrate healthy urban design into the new P Barton Park uh, housing development and, and your special interests are in community activation and the, and the built environment. So over to you, Iona. Thank you. Thank you. So hi everyone, my name's Iona O'Carroll and I'm here to tell you about a place called Barton and Barton Park and the healthy place shaping work we've implemented in this area. I'm the Community Health Development Officer for Barton and Barton Park and I've led on the Barton Healthy Newtown for the past year and a half and I'll tell you a little now about the background to the area of this work. So, sorry. Barton is a neighbourhood only 3.4 miles from the centre of Oxford but you wouldn't know it from looking at it. In one of the most unequal cities in the UK there is no shortage of wealth but huge disparity in how it's distributed. Barton faces significant health inequalities with those living there dying on average 9.6 years earlier than their counterparts in North Oxford, just four miles away. Contributing factors include low levels of education, a high number of residents experiencing long-term health conditions, most now considered in the clinically extremely vulnerable list, and an aging social housing stock. 
where children have been known to eat ice cream for breakfast and the local chippy is open from 8am. However, Barton does have so much going for it, including its community and assets, both physical and social, an incredible community association with deep rooted community spirit, the deep sense of belonging people have with their community, all against the breathtaking backdrop of a beautiful natural environment with secret copses and a babbling brook. Ten years ago, Oxford City Council chose to partner up with Grosvenor to deliver Barton Park, an 885 home extension to Barton, and this was the catalyst for the regeneration of Barton and the start of our Healthy Newtown journey. It was go always going to be a challenge to consider how to integrate the new and existing community, so considerations of the built environment was integral. Fast forward to 2016, Barton was chosen by NHS England to be one of its 10 funded Healthy Newtown pilots. It recognised that the planning for this new development had taken into consideration what buildings, infrastructure and facilities were needed to promote healthy lifestyles. It was at this point that we chose to have the whole of Barton become the healthy new town, not just the new development. Grosvenor and the City Council invested considerably in improving the primary care facilities alongside the long overdue refurbishment of Barton Neighbourhood Centre, creating a health hub where anyone in the community could come and get support. The modernisation of the community and youth spaces, installation of a new library, demonstrated the importance of delivering the appropriate infrastructure if you want to fundamentally change health attitudes and trends. This work continued despite the challenges of lockdown, with the community association developing a community larder for everyone to have access to healthy and affordable food. Locally, we recognise that you need more than just the built environment, like buildings, cycle paths and community facilities, to create a healthy city. We needed community activation and a radical change to how people use, interact with and access services through developing new models of care with the local social prescribing teams, essential to a community like Barton, with entrenched health, social and economic issues. A partnership was developed between the developers and different statutory and community organisations in Barton to better understand the health needs, utilising our public health colleagues, and a strong focus was given to empowering the community and delivering sustainable community services that would leave a legacy to Barton and Barton Park for years to come. My role in Barton has been to do just that, through building relationships with existing residents, to empower people to find their own solutions to health inequalities experienced here, and supporting people to develop their own community-led programmes to remove barriers and find meaningful solutions outside of the statutory services already provided. Grosvenor recognised the value of funding a community health development officer to carry out this work for at least three years, as this work takes time and is not a quick fix. As a local resident of Barton myself, I have been fortunate to be in a position to understand the issues many people in Barton faced and privileged to have the trust of the local community to support people to take their ideas forward. We believe that a community connector is vital to making a difference when it comes to activating and bringing together disenfranchised individuals through shared interests by leveraging the potential of the built environment and community assets. This way of working alongside the community has been important to local residents as it represents a place that people care about, creates a sense of ownership and helps residents feel proud of where they live, while encouraging a sense of identity and building community. So far, I've supported local groups and residents to develop a series of projects and initiatives that focus on encouraging active travel and providing spaces for people to come together and make new connections. Some of these include health walks, with local residents being trained as health walk leaders to get people active, the Barton Park School Walking Bus, which is an initiative to support families to safely walk to school. Joy Riders female-led bike rides for beginners to develop the confidence to get on a bike. The Men's Mental Health Football Group provides a place for local men to be active and talk about their well-being. The Barton Community Partnership is a group of local residents who put on events and workshops to bring people together to reduce isolation and loneliness. And the Community Larda Cafe provides a place for Larda members to meet and make new friends. The Wellbeing Garden Digs are there to provide people with the skills to grow their own food. I've chosen today to focus on the built environment surrounding the linear path along Bayswater Brook that begins in Barton and ends in Barton Park. The new path represents a small intervention with a big impact 
and encourages integration with the two areas, cohesion, continuity and convenience with existing Barton. Residents have commented that since the development of Barton Park, the linear path feels safer, looks nicer, is less muddy and more wheelchair and pushchair friendly and more practical. New gym equipment was installed to encourage longer fitness trails with the same outdoor gym equipment used in Barton to ensure everyone has access to the same facilities. A health walk led by two local residents has encouraged people from Barton, who previously had no reason to visit Barton Park, to traverse the route weekly. The linear path has additionally provided a new exit on the Barton Park side, which has increased the use of active travel on foot and bikes, as there is now a new route out of Barton that avoids the steep and difficult hills infamous to those who live there. Grosvenor funded a public art project that has seen a series of installations along the path that helps bring the area to life. The outdoor living statues installed were a perfect opportunity to reflect what people are proud of in Barton. The beautiful fields surrounding the area and natural wildlife habitats for animals. The wellbeing garden installed took the form of tiered allotments for communal growing of vegetables and wildflowers with a weekly social prescribing course designed specifically for people with mental health issues to connect with nature and each other. A rockery in both Barton and Barton Park allowed for workshops to be delivered with local children from both sides to create colourful rocks that show what Barton means to them, telling a story and leaving a piece of history through art. New seating through the form of parklets have provided spaces for residents to picnic and rest while soaking in the natural environment. Considering how the linear path is now used, it's a great example of how the small steps to the built environment can have a huge impact on the physical and mental well-being of those who live there. In my last few moments with you, I just want to tell you a story about my grandma who recently returned to Barton after many years since moving away to attend a community event with me. She immediately commented on the linear path and reminisced about how historically getting out of Barton has always been an issue and a barrier for most people who live here. How difficult it was to get up the hill, how psychologically and physically challenging it is to traverse the roundabout where the Barton exit is the only one without a traffic light, and how the underpasses never felt safe to use alone. And now there is a safe and accessible new route out of Barton for everyone to use and enjoy. Thank you. Really. Fantastic. Fantastic. And congratulations on, on that. That's absolutely brilliant. So uh, our, our final of our trio is Rosie Rowe. Rosie, welcome. Uh, lead for Healthy Place Shaping at Oxfordshire County Council, the County Council this time. Uh, background is in the NHS, initially working on the integration of health and social care before becoming lead for the Healthy New Town programme in Bicester. And you're now involved, Rosie, in implementing lessons from that BISTA programme across the county, both in regeneration areas and in new build. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, can I have the uh, clicker? Thank you. Right. Good evening, everyone. Um, and as you'd expect from uh, someone with a public health background, um, I want to talk about uh, COVID um, and really locate my com comments in relation to uh, the challenges that COVID presents us as we recover from the pandemic, but also some of the opportunities that the built environment really present in, in terms of creating healthy places and healthy cities. So a, a very short um, run through in terms of some of the key issues we're facing from, from COVID, all of which I'm sure you're very familiar with. Um, obviously, and there are significant issues in terms of mental health and well-being that have deteriorated, um, especially amongst younger people, um, especially those who are in teenage through to about the age of 40. Um, those are the cohorts that have really been impacted. And despite the fact that uh, uh, things have opened up, uh, uh, the, there is significant levels of depression and anxiety in those groups. Um, we've seen the depression rates double. Um, since the uh, pre-pandemic levels and we know that uh, referrals to uh, children's adult mental health services uh, have been so significant that it's now an 18 month wait before you can be seen. So really significant problems and we frankly don't know how long the, the impact of those will be. 
Physical activity levels, we, yes, we saw some lovely images, people walking and cycling more during lockdown, but actually there is a whole group of particularly older people who shielded during, um, during the pandemic who have lost a lot of condition because they didn't exercise, weren't able to exercise, um, and who have lost not only condition and muscular condition, but actual confidence to actually be outside and to exercise. So um, some, some significant physical health problems. And that adds to the fact that we know that even in uh, a, a fairly healthy, prosperous county like Oxfordshire, a third of adults, a third of kids, don't do 30 minutes of exercise a week. It's pretty shocking, really. Um, and then um, that highlights another area which has really been exacerbated by the pandemic, which is um, the health inequalities, uh, which we knew were bad. And uh, Iona's has already talked about the, the decade difference in life expectancy um, that you can have uh, someone who's born in Barton versus someone who is born in Summertown in Oxford. Um, but we also know that actual life expectancy for, for women is actually falling now. So um, some, some, some major problems. What's this got to do with the built environment? Well, fundamentally, it's those wider determinants of health that, um, that really impact on whether people live long, healthy lives. Um, as um, as Larry Cohen said, um, it's not your genetic code, it's your postcode that counts and impacts on health and well-being. And I think the um, experience of the pandemic has identified some opportunities for us in terms of tackling these, these really wicked health and well-being problems. So one of the key things is that the importance of neighbourhoods came, came to the fore. Um, as people uh, experienced lockdowns, uh, weren't able to access um, travel and so on, people really appreciated the importance of their local centre, being able to access local services um, and having the opportunity to move around on foot or by bicycle and to interact with their neighbourhoods. And this has got critical implications for, our, for the, how we design, how we regenerate neighbourhoods. Uh, it's it's uh, about identifying the opportunities that, and the existing assets in communities and building on those. And things like the 20 Minute Neighbourhood Tool is extremely helpful in getting us to think differently about, about how we use and design our neighbourhoods. And that's, that's a long term trend. I know that lots of people couldn't um, work from home and those people who did work from home have potentially gone back to the office, but that's full scale office working, dormitory towns needs to be a thing of the past. The second built environment uh, opportunity is around the importance of green and blue spaces. I think people really now understand and appreciate the benefits of connectivity to nature. And we've got to get better at, in terms of thinking about how we can green our cities, not just in terms of parks and, 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 and major sport, sports areas, but those small areas, those meanwhile spaces, those opportunities for parklets and so on, where, it's a, where, where people have a, a sense of connectivity and where also we can promote the biodiversity that's needed for, uh, for planetary health. And then the third area that I think is absolutely critical is about the quality and the security and the provision of affordable homes. And I think the cost of living crisis that we're experiencing at the moment, we're all experiencing it, but for those people who are living in the private rented sector, where you have landlords who have no incentive to improve the energy efficiency of their, of their properties, is, is, a, is a scandal and, it's, and we don't have the levers at the moment to really address this. And if we can't uh, generate and increase the supply of affordable homes, then we have an, other additional problems. So in Oxfordshire, we have a retention and recruitment problems in the health and social care sector. Those fantastic key workers that we clapped every Thursday because they can't afford to live locally. So what happens, they have to live a long way from where they work and then they commute in, creating huge congestion problems, which again is really bad in terms of meeting our climate action targets. So we have to get cl more clever about really providing affordable homes. So those are some long-term issues. 
I think um, there are some ways that we can address those, uh, and I'm going to point to a few more that we may then discuss in the, in the panel area. So one is I think we absolutely need those stronger relationships, the partnerships that Iona's talked about uh, uh, that has been experienced in Barton and also in Bista. We need more enlightened developers like Grosvenor, um, like A2 Dominion, who really get this and see the importance of health in place. And we need to incentivize our sort of major housing uh, developers to see the importance and the need for better urban design and planning. Planning, our planners need to have more sticks as well as more resources to help work with developers. Our planning policy framework, our design guides are not strong enough to ensure that we actually create the kind of beautiful places that, that they are supposed to do and to put health uh, more firmly in, in, in terms of both the sustainability for the planet but also for people. And then the third area I think is about training of architects and our urban designers and our planners and health colleagues. We need to improve that co-training, co-development of understanding of each other's disciplines so that we actually really inform what we, what we do and we actually design for what's needed. So those are, the, those are quite long-term issues. Short-term, practical things can help. And I finally turn to this slide. So um, this is a little area in Vista, classic 1970s metal barriers stopping people. Anyone who's got a buggy could never get around that. And try getting through that with a mobility scooter, not a chance. How much did it cost to put in that wooden post? cost £2,000 and for, as a result you can, you've got you, it's so much easier for people to walk and to cycle, to interact with their neighbour, to feel safe. This is something that we can be doing in our local neighbourhoods now. It's not a huge amount of money and it's something that we've really got to start delivering on because if we don't do it we're not going to create the health enabling environment that's needed to address these wicked health problems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosie. That, that was great. Eddie. Why was it 2,000 quid for that post? Well, taking, post taking, great. Taking, taking out the metal barriers, getting oh, it, uh, right. health and safety, <laughs> implementing it. Yep. Right. it, it takes Filling in the forms. That's right. Yeah. But no, great, great stuff. Thank, thank you to all three of our speakers. That was terrific. And we're, we're moving into questions and, and comments from the floor. Uh, I don't know who would like to... to to be brave enough to start the ball rolling. Um, I just had one or two th um, uh, immediate thoughts. I mean, Iona, the, uh, that whole concept of you, a community health development officer, how unique are you? Uh, are we now seeing community health development officers who are really community activists in old fashioned language? Uh, are we now seeing a growth of this? Are you unique or part of a whole network? Um, I'm, pr I'm pr yeah, do you want me to, pr <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I think my role is quite unique. Um, I'm, I am the only community health development officer doing the work that I'm doing that's been funded by Grosvenor. I think it's a really new model. Um, it, the fact that it has helped so much in Barton so far, the work that we have all been doing, um, there has just been funding sourced to recruit another community health development officer to work in Rose Hill and Blackbird Lees, um, but there's only six months funding for that post. Um, and I think part of, of the key role that I do is that it needs to be long term, because as I said in my, in my um, pitch, that th this isn't a quick fix. Um, and it's about building relationships with the community and understanding the issues that people face. And that's not something that you can do overnight. And I think there's a big issue with trust um, coming in to, to communities that are very used to things being done to them and not with them. Um, yeah, but I think it's needed. We need more funding for these posts. So in some certain places, um, the district councils, local planning authorities have um, part of their section 106 requirements are for significant developments like the scale of uh, Barton Park, 
that they, they are required to fund a community development officer in that, in that format. They tend to be for two years or less, and that is an issue. But that, that does need to be standard, um, and it, it does need to be th for three years. Um, having the experience of uh, the Healthy Newtown program. You, y if you're going to connect um, an existing community with a new development, you need to build that time in, in, and factor it in. So they are increasingly uh, available if the planning authority require it, and it comes down to those requirements within Section 106 agreements. Not only requiring it in the Section 106 agreement, but seeing that it actually happens because so often it is the case that the developer, I'm sorry if we've got some uh, developers amongst our audience, uh, wriggle out of their responsibilities and their obligations. It just doesn't happen at the end of the day. Uh, and that deters other people from saying yes to development near them. But uh, did you want to have a, c a comment, Helen, on this one? Or um, I mean, I, I, I'm happy if you want to move on to another question. OK, or, or if anyone would like to join in on this one, please. Do you need a microphone? Is Robert will bring one. Hello, my name is Graham Smith. I taught at Brooks in urban design and architecture for a lifetime. Um, the one thing that hasn't been, one profession that has been mentioned is highway engineering. And uh, for the last 20 or 30 years, I've been deeply engaged with uh, battling and educating highway engineers. Uh, everything that has been built for the last 60 years has been built for the car. But that also means that walking, obviously walking can't be impossible, but anywhere to walk to is not available. Um, the county council bless, um, has got a new street design guide which replaced the born in the 1960s guide uh, a few months ago. It's still useless. It still does not uh, enable or demand the 15 minutes or the 20 minute city and engineers make decisions all the time about barriers, safety engineers, um, about layers of roads, about what can be accessed. Um, I, I would say that um, architects might be stupid, uh, often they are, uh, urban designers might be all right, um, but unless you get the engineers uh, to deliver policy, they refuse to acknowledge built form implications of, of policy all the time, continuously, and tell lies about it. Just while we've got you as an expert on this, to whom are those highway engineers who are misbehaving, in, in, in your view, to whom are they responsible? Uh, to no one but themselves. Yeah. Well, that's a bit of generalisation. The Department of Transport doesn't have direct power over highway authorities. So they're actually phenomenally independent. And so in, my, in the last couple of years, let's say, I think I've been to a couple of the many meetings I've been to or been at where engineers have attended. Plenty of architects, plenty of planners, often plenty of developers. Yeah, but right. the developers can only do what they're allowed to do. Uh, you know, so sometimes it's the refuse department that designs the development. Yeah. Any comments from Rosie? So I, um, I, I empathise with your experience. Um, so I've, I've been sitting within public health within the county council for about a year and a half now and started to really try to build those relationships with the highway engineers. You find that transport planners, they kind of broadly get this. So the strategy is, says all the right things, so, you know, the, the priorities are about the pedestrian uh, and about cyclists. Um, but if you look at, and if you look at the policies, local transport connectivity plan, um, number four, with writing number five, they say all the right things and then they fall down in the delivery. Um, so one thing that we are doing to try to really uh, force um, some of this is in the use of health impact assessments. So health impact assessments are generally a, an assessment tool that's used ideally in the master planning, in the pre-app stage uh, of major developments in terms of housing developments. And um, what we've been developing locally is a tool for use with highway schemes, from which, which will work for a small cycle route improvement to a major change in the A40. And the plan is for it to be used at different stages in the highway's design process, because we know, as with many housing developments, good design gets value engineered out. 
So it may start reasonable and, it will, and all the good things will disappear. So what, what we're planning is a, a staged approach where we will require this health impact assessment to be done at different points. It's a really hard nut to crack. Um, and it's quite interesting when I talk to my transport strategy colleagues that even they find it really hard to make the changes. But we're trying to develop the tools um, and, um, and to, to do that training. It's a cultural issue um, uh, that to, to really try to change things, which is why I come back to education. We've got to change how and, and, and have more multidisciplinary training. But Rosie, do we need health engineers to be more locally accountable? As you know, health engineers, highways engineers, to be more locally accountable. Uh, the fact that they are able to dictate policy that affects the design and the planning. Well, I, it, will de it, it, it really depends on the administration. So um, if you're a highways officer, uh, uh, you are accountable to the political members to whom you report. Um, and in the, uh, with the new administration, uh, which is obviously uh, the Fair Deal Alliance, which has got Green and uh, Lib, Lib Dems and, and Labour support, um, they're going to be wanting and expecting to see changes. Um, so ultimately, they are, those highways engineers are accountable. But if you think about how long it takes for these highway schemes to be designed, engineered and delivered, that's a long time scale, and they are now delivering things that got designed 10 years ago, which frankly need to be redesigned. Definitely, yeah. Um. I think it's interesting that you brought this up because with, uh, in the work that I was um, presenting, we did some interviews internationally of different built environment um, professionals, so it included landscape architects and architects, urban designers, etc. And this issue of highways engineering and transport issues affecting the design of buildings and the form of buildings came up time and again internationally. So it's not just here in the UK, it's coming up in many places where uh, outdated car-centric thinking and uh, that sort of trumps everything within the design of a new development so that you end up with smaller buildings and the landscape uh, design isn't as good. And so I think it's a huge problem and I guess it must go back to the power of uh, lobby groups over time to get in place these kinds of um, regulations and, and decision making structures. I think it should be challenged and it also needs to take into consideration autonomous vehicles because I think that will uh, create a whole new host of problems that will be related to uh, highways infrastructure going forward. And uh, I'm not sure how quickly that will come to a place like Oxford, but it is certainly on the horizon. Um, I think the, the issue of highways engineering and you know, how it affects the design of new developments was also raised in uh, Matthew Carmona's recent work uh, looking at auditing uh, new housing development. So it clearly is one of the key problems that we have in terms of the quality of new design. I think there's also a point in relation to the cost benefit analysis that's done in the uh, transport planning process so that it doesn't take into account the health impacts of, um, of, of the, de the transport uh, infrastructure that's going ahead. And there have been proposals to change that and I think that's a really clear way. So in addition to something like health impact assessment is to go to this core of the cost benefit analysis that's apparently is very flawed and, and that's something I've only briefly looked into and there might be other experts in the room who know more about that than I do. Do you want to come in on that? Or? No. no? Uh, well one other point on, on Barton Park I, I would like to know, it, it, came, it struck me that it's um, quite separate to the, to the existing, the other side of, uh, of the large A road yeah. and there was, there was talk about some proposals to create um, a safe crossing point. Yeah. What's the status of that and could that happen? That's a very controversial question. Um, so yeah, local residents uh, I think mostly very unhappy with the design of the crossing of the A40. Um, I think in the original plans it was discussed that there would be a bridge, a footbridge over the, the A40, which, which there is in, in most other areas of Oxford. Um, and I know personally many parents who have to cross from Northway over into Barton Park to take their children to Barton Park Primary School and they don't feel safe crossing there with their children. Um, and so there is a big movement locally um, and there, you know, there's petitions going around uh, currently and there was a meeting a few weeks ago about this 
Um, I don't think anything has been decided yet. Um, but my other comment, regard um, separate to the A40 crossing, is that um, in Barton Park itself, highways are still yet to adopt the roads where people have been living for up to sort of two to three years now. Um, so there, there was a big issue with speeding through the estate. Um, and there's no way to enforce that currently because highways haven't adopted it. Um, and again, speeding through a, prim a primary school where lots of children are crossing doesn't feel very safe for residents. So I think, yeah, I agree with all the comments that have been made. We worked at, I used to run the Roundtree Foundation for many years and we created these things called home zones. Home zones are pedestrians first, cars, last. Uh, basically, uh, if you go to the, the, the latest uh, Roundtree development, which is 500 homes on the east side of York, uh, you, you discover if you try and drive onto these, it, it, you have to go at a snail's pace because there's a tree in the middle of the road and then there's a bench uh, and then the thing wiggles a bit. Uh, but I I if the road is created with the thought that this wants to help people to walk and cycle and be healthy and, and safe out of doors, that it's a different road to the straight line that the efficient uh, uh, health uh, highways engineer believes is, is necessary. But yeah, anyway, other thoughts from people, please. Just say who you are if you. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, David Prout, I'm Pro Vice Chancellor at the university and have responsibility for our estates program and development for the university. Um, I'm also a long-term employee in central and local government and have dealt with these issues at both local and central government level. Um, just on the local issue about the, the, the problem of roundabouts on the Ring Road in Oxford, this is a huge problem, not just at Barton Park, I'm saying most of the roundabouts that uh, enable you to get from outside the ring road to inside the ring road at Oxford are dangerous. And actually, to give her her credit, Liz uh, Lefty, the, um, the new leader of the County Council, has accepted a meeting with us, which will take place later this month, to discuss this problem, uh, where it's associated with our new developments that are coming forward in the area, just outside the ring road. Uh, and our proposal is really that Section 106 money should be uh, diverted from investment in car infrastructure to investment in making the roundabouts safe for cyclists and walkers. That's what we will be proposing to Liz when we meet her. And um, I'm hoping we get a good response. The, the question I wanted to raise though is that a lot of people on the panel have talked about the benefits of regulation. Regulation's the answer. Let's regulate, let's regulate, let's regulate. I, I put it to you that regulation is cheap actually, you can regulate. It's, it's a, it's a knee-jerk political reaction to any problem. We will legislate, we will regulate. But my experience, and I, I suspect this would be the experience of Roundtree in the development you were just describing outside York, is that the issue is really the under-resourcing of the regulators you're trying to interact with. You want to have an iterative dialogue that enables you to leave a tree in the middle of the road. Or, as with one of the schemes I did, the removal of all <coughs> the pavements in Exhibition Road in London. You want to have an iterative dialogue. That requires a lot of resource on the regulator's side. And my experience is that um, the regulators often don't have the time to have a proper dialogue, which results in a standard sort of computer says no answer to the question, can we leave this tree in the middle of the road? Um, and in fact, I'm pretty amazed that you've got those uh, metal barriers removed, mm. because I think the highway engineer reading of those metal barriers is that it would stop a cyclist flying from the cycle path out into the road and getting killed. And when you've removed those metal barriers, you've got a safety problem. And the highway engineer, I bet would have advised the local authority um, cabinet member that they would have a, a, a liability if they remove the metal barriers and replace them with wooden posts because they increase the danger to cyclists prevented by the existence of the metal barriers. But my question, <coughs> sorry it's gone so long, is it regulation really or is it resource and dialogue and 
local discussion. If, if you're going to have enforcement, you have to have the regulation to enforce. So I think they go together, but you're at, you must be right that if you have regulation, we pass stuff in Parliament, I, I produce private members' bills, we've done wonderful things, nothing happens thereafter because there's nobody to enforce the brilliant uh, plan that we've, we've, we've put forward. So you, you must be right, one has to resource the enforcement or design out the problem in the first place. Mm. But no, 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 you can't regulate for everything. <coughs> no, you can't. I, I would say you need to have both, um, and and it, uh, the the capacity of planning teams is woeful at the moment, yeah, and and has been getting worse um, since uh, I've been working with planning teams the last seven years now, and and I've just seen the numbers and the capacity drop and drop. Um, and and it and it is a real problem because the, those planners who are are in post actually do want to have those dialogues. They want to get to get engaged up through the pre-app stage and and to have you know design review panels and to to do that the, the good work that they're trained to do, and they just haven't got the capacity. And so it does in a way fall back to you know what does the computer say? What do the regulations say? Um, and I, and I think, I think for enlightened developers, if you've got the if you've got the planners and a, enough capacity in planning, that is absolutely the better way to do it. But for some developers, you need to have that regulation. You need to have something that so that the planners have got something to go back to them and say that's not good enough. Yes, please. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think. This issue comes up a lot in, in the interviews that we did internationally as well in terms of regulation and one point that I would raise in terms of new development coming forward and using planning policy to make sure that it's and you know building regulations uh, which are often not met and that's been a big um, scandal of course. So we've seen the limits of regulation but also needing to consider that if we rely on the private sector or the developer to uh, put forward a high quality proposal because uh, they, they want to and they feel that it's in line with their business needs, then they will be looking at the business case and, and uh, looking at the value of those additional high quality design measures. And this has been an area of a lot of discussion where uh, the value of creating a healthy place isn't very uh, clear to measure and it can accrue over many years and therefore it doesn't return to the developer. Some people have said and, and they've been able to demonstrate um, higher price for the sale of homes which are higher quality but that is directly misaligned with our goals for health equity and it can mean that we aren't able to deliver as many affordable homes on those sites um, if additional monies have gone toward amenities and landscape architecture. So balancing all of these costs on the development and ensuring that we have um, a high quality uh, development coming forward that hasn't been driven by ve regulation but has been driven by uh, the developer's uh, own instincts or uh, what Rosie was calling an enlightened developer. That came out a lot in our interviews, people saying these develop we want to work with developers who are value driven and enlightened and uh, there's a group of these, there just don't seem to be enough of them, unfortunately. Um, so I think that's the challenge, is in the development economics. And can we make uh, a business case that says it's not only in um, a higher sales uh, for the properties themselves, because that wouldn't uh, help us with our affordability crisis and our key workers living uh, in, in central locations. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just one illustration of, of, of the enforcement point. Um, in the private rented sector, it is illegal to let a property with an energy performance certificate of below E, you know, it the goes from A to G. Uh, if you go below E, you shouldn't be letting that property. Everybody, I've had it done for Bristol, can produce a list in every city of all of the properties that have not scored uh, at the E level. They are below that and they are illegal to let. You can put alongside that all of the addresses of the landlords 
if you're using, you know, this is data analysis. So we know exactly where the landlords are who are letting property illegally because the energy performance standards are so low that they don't, that they shouldn't be letting them at all. But nobody's doing anything about it. We don't have environmental health officers knocking on the door and saying, I'm sorry, this is an illegal let, uh, and we're going to fine you, and I'm going to come back in a week, and if nothing is happening, I'm going to fine you again. We, we just don't have the people to implement excellent legislation, excellent <laughs> regulation, I think, but uh, not enforced. But sorry, another, another po new point, please, yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Matthew Hardy from the Princess Foundation visiting fellow at this college. Then my question comes back to the, the vexed question of the, the rules and engineers and so on. Um, the, 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 someone, one of the most effective people I know creating change, Andres Duaney, suggested that the answer was to change the rules, not the, not the people who administer the rules. And, and to that extent, we now have LTN 120, which finally provides regulations for proper, decent cycle infrastructure. And I know Manual for Streets is currently being rewritten to bring it up to date and, and to finally get rid of the last ghosts of Design Hall 32 out of it. Um, so my question is, I guess to the panel, you know, is that going to be enough? Uh, are the engineers simply <coughs> going to administer a, a, a decent standards <coughs> uh, by, by changing what they, what they have to deliver in, in the sense of professional competence? Are we back to the highways engineers again? Oh, yeah. no. You can't escape them. <laughs> we can't right. escape them. Yeah. Really? So the, um, the health impact assessment tool that we've developed for infrastructure schemes are based on those L L um, L120 uh, principal standards. And, and I think you, you have to use the standards that they feel familiar and, com well, maybe not familiar with, but which is within their discipline. Um, and, and then you have to do a lot of awareness and a lot of education. Um, and the younger, the younger ones kind of get it, um, the senior ones understand it, and it's the ones in the middle um, that, uh, that you really need to focus on. So um, will they be enough? It's, it's all about that, that wider en engagement, awareness, education, and um, having a, a system of checking to say, actually, are we, are, we, are we getting to deliver what we say we are going to deliver in terms of our policy goals? Um, and I, you know, I think it does require political will. So you know, introducing um, LTNs in Oxford has definitely required political will. It will con continue to require that political will um, to sustain them and to 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 in, enforce some pretty un, um, uncomfortable measures for people and if you look at places like Waltham Forest which is now 10 years it's taken 10 years to get to that point where people say well of course it's a, a great success um, and we're trying to turbocharge it in in Oxford and, and various other places um, so you know you do need to have some strong political support to both enforce these things and to stand firm against some opposition. Yeah, that was low traffic neighbourhoods for those Sorry. who didn't. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Any more thoughts? Did you want to I say? I just had a quick you? point on that. Um, I think a lot of uh, built environment professionals interested in health have been saying cars are the new smoking because we see them as being so bad for health and. Um, really difficult to figure out a way to reduce the impact of cars on our health and well-being for, for so many different reasons uh, in different places. With the low traffic neighborhoods, I think that's an ongoing area that is really interesting and I think not yet fully determined in London how successful that's been. I think the research by Rachel Aldred at, uh, I believe she's at Westminster, has been really good in showing a strong um, positive impact of the LTNs for lots of different uh, measures, including equity and, um, and lots of things. But then there has also been this really contentious nature to it where people have said, well, actually, this isn't good for uh, equity. And, and some communities have said our neighborhood has been targeted because um, we are a low income or a racial minority group and we don't want this LTN because it isn't supporting us in, in particular ways. So I think this is unresolved, but these are exactly the sort of debates and conversations that we need to have. 
and hopefully through the, that kind of um, interaction and trialing something which really was upscaled very quickly because of the pandemic, we, we may be able to find something that's you know, usable and, and beneficial for different reasons. But the contentious nature of it, I think that the technical design, technical codes and things won't, won't solve these issues. It, it's much more about the political and the, the people issues, I think. But just, just say what are the, the, the downsides of low traffic neighborhoods? What are the objections? I think some, some communities feel that um, if they have a low traffic neighborhood, it um, reduces their ability to um, move in and out of that space as easily as they had done before. And I, by I'm car. by car, I believe so. Yeah. I, I don't think it affects any other. Um, I think some people have also been uh, concerned about um, emergency vehicles, but I think that was demonstrated to be uh, not a problem. So I, I couldn't say that I can represent the full story. So the I think that the, the evidence is out in, in Oxford, um, so there's some concerns about traffic displacement um, and, um, and, and I think also for, again, from an equity perspective, some people who drive for a living um, are finding it difficult and we also know that some um, health and, and care workers, so the emergency vehicle situation has been broadly resolved, um, but for those who are um, doing home visits, those kind of issues, it's extended journey times, that's reduced the number of people that they can potentially visit. So there are unintended consequences of these, these um, low traffic neighbourhoods, which is why they should be a pilot. Um, and, um, and I think we, we just need to continue to build that evidence base and to, to have that ongoing dialogue with local people. Um, the, um, the, you know, there's often a very vocal um, group of people who are very against it. Those people actually living within a, a low, low traffic, traffic neighbourhood have often been very supportive. So, um, yeah, the verdict's out, I think. It's the people passing through who have objected. Yeah, do you want to? Yeah. Please, I hear. I think what you um, said earlier about it affecting low in income families in particular is worth mentioning. Um, and I think if you're going to have low traffic neighbourhoods, you also need to consider um, packages that go along with that for people, for so specific, specifically for families with you know multiple children that are not in walking distance to primary schools, which we know is an issue in Oxford, that people don't always get the place in their local primary school when they have to travel. Um, actually, going by foot is not possible and if you're going to ride a bike it's very expensive and often prohibitive for families to afford to buy bikes and the kit that you need and I think if, if we had things like cargo bikes for families um, it would be a lot easier for low income families and I think for, yeah I think it, it impacts heavily on them. And not safe because it's not entirely safe to cycle in Oxford. If you're confident yeah. it's, very, it's very nice to cycle if you're confident but if you're not if you don't have the practice, where do you practice? Where do you learn? Uh, you don't have segregated cycleways for most of the, the, the street, the junctions are a disaster. Uh, there's people, that three people that have been killed the last year, if I, uh, if I remember correctly, from just cycling in, in places where it's supposedly, the, like the plain roundabout has cycling marks, the access to uh, Oxford Parkway, which has cycling of some sort of um, um, cycleways, but it's not really, but it's not safe, so it's not just the affordability issues. The can you actually do it? it can I, is it worth doing it? And we don't have cycling proficiency in our primary schools in Oxford. <laughs> Amongst many other things. Could I say something about home zones? <coughs> yeah, please. <coughs> I was part of um, uh, running conferences and uh, and lectures on. Uh, on the bone earth, uh, back in the uh, mid 80s. And, cheers. Uh, I was part of um, taking visits with uh, students and postgrads and sometimes engineers and planners in the county uh, to the Netherlands and Germany to look at uh, the bone earth or home zone in the, uh, in the 80s. And one of the things that I was very surprised, shocked to learn that we hadn't, that I hadn't heard talked about in the current arguments about LTMs, uh, the, um, an engineer, a senior engineer in Maastricht said, uh, we've stopped doing the bone earth. 
and I was completely shocked. And he said, because the ones that I'd seen were unbelievably beautiful and wonderful. And he said, the problem is that uh, they've mostly been done in the in the um, the poorer areas. And so now we find that if if a vote, if a voter is mentioned to another area, <clears throat> one of the strong responses, I think it lasted a couple of years or so, was we don't want one of those because people think we're poor. In that case in Oxford at the time, I can remember suggesting that uh, Beaumont Street, the Beaumont Street area, that um, had an interest in uh, in becoming a, a boner for a home zone. And I suggested to the friends on the city council, it would be a really good idea to do Beaumont Street as a home zone because it's a rich area and, and it would immediately head off any possibility of, of it being unacceptable uh, socially, so to speak. Absolutely. Home zones for all levels of income and prosperity. Now we've run out of time. Is there anybody burning to put one last point to us before we, we close proceedings? Yes, somebody is, must get this off their chest. Please, please do. Thank you very much. Uh, Tim Dixon, School of the Built Environment, University of Reading. I'm, I was really interested in all of the presentations, so thank you so much for those. Just a, a quick question on developers and the concept that there are very few developers, in my view, and certainly my experience, who are place keepers rather than place makers. And we have tools upstream, such as Brian Communities, um, which can measure the kind of potential of social sustainability, quality of life, etc., in a new development. But um, countryside and um, Barclay are two of the developers that I've worked with, with Social Life, to kind of develop a downstream tool to look at social sustainability. So I was wondering, in the context particularly I own of the Grosvenor uh, project at Barton, whether Grosvenor fall into that category of a place keeper and whether they are measuring the impact of that intervention on the existing residents, but also on the people who are moving there. What, how is the development panning out for them? And is that something that's going to happen in terms of a regular survey, for example, or any kind of assessment or measure? Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think part of the model that uh, Grosvenor have adopted with uh, the City Council and the Oxford LLP is through the Barton <coughs> Healthy Newtown Steering Group, um, which is made up of Grosvenor City Council, uh, Public Oxford Public Health um, and Oxfordshire Clinical Commissioning Group. And I'm part of that. And I think um, a, a huge part of the, the way they're monitoring the work that's going on and the integration of Barton Park and Barton and how residents feel is through the work that I do in my role. Um, and another part of my role is to uh, deliver post-occupancy surveys in Barton Park um, and attend the residence focus group meetings in Barton Park. And so that information does get fed back to Grosvenor. So I think they are really invested in understanding what is working and what's not working. Um, yeah, but my, my role is funded for another year and a half. So I can't comment on beyond what's going to happen when that finishes and that model ends or continues. Um, I have to watch this space. Okay, thanks. Sir. Yeah. And thank goodness you mentioned those post-occupancy evaluations, which architects often talk about, and I, I'm absolutely sure we've forgotten to put in our report. So <laughs> you've already, you, you've added a sentence at least, it might even be a paragraph, <laughs> because it's ter it is terribly important for architects to find out what worked and what didn't work, work, instead of just walking away from it and making the same mistakes over and over again. Well, thank you all very much indeed for your attendance and your questions, but very special thanks to my three panellists, uh, Iona, Helen and Rosie. Can I ask you to show your appreciation in the usual way? <laughs> <laughs>